Okay, uh, thanks, Kurt. Uh, so the two diseases I'm going to be covering this afternoon are black leg and rhizoctonia. So I'll apologize if there's going to be some overlap with, with uh, what Lindsay's talked about, but on the other hand, I think reiteration and repetition is good to try and get the message across. Uh, the other thing that I hope to do with these slides is to give you an idea of what the disease looks like so that you can identify it out in the field. Uh, having a lot more eyes out in the field to be able to spot this disease I think is going to be very important. But certainly black leg, uh, if it does move into this area, would really become a game changer. It's certainly the most important uh, disease of brassica worldwide. Uh, it's endemic in the Canadian provinces and the Midwest and also Australia and Europe. So really, we're kind of blessed and we're one of the few places in the world uh, that have been able to grow these oilseed uh, uh, crops without this disease. And um, Washington and Idaho were considered black leg free and you heard the story that Lindsay uh, talked about how they had an outbreak in the 1970s. Uh, unfortunately, in 2011, we've uh, discovered an outbreak of this in Bonner's Ferry. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more detail on some of these other findings. Um, and then Lindsay talked a little bit about that uh, outbreak we had in the Willamette Valley uh, this spring. Of course, the Willamette Valley is a much higher rainfall area, uh, much more uh, conducive environment for this disease. Uh, and as she mentioned, they found it uh, just an outbreak on a whole variety of different brassica crops, everything from vegetable crops to forage brassicas, and even to volunteer mustards and brassica weeds. So that's another thing I want to uh, emphasizes the fact that a lot of our mustards uh, that are normally weeds out there can also host this disease. So that's another thing to consider. Uh, and then uh, recently the Oregon Department of Agriculture passed these regulations and in fact they've designated not only the Willamette Valley but they've designated these other what they call protected districts. So even on the east side here they now have these protected districts. <laughs> and, and what does that protected district mean? It means that within those areas, all the seed must be tested to be black leg free. All the seed must be either treated with a fungicide or with a hot water treatment. So hot water can also uh, eliminate the pathogen from, from that seed coat. So again, another take home message is that this is seed borne and this has been the primary means of spreading into, into new areas. Okay, um, also, the uh, brassicas cannot be grown on a plot of land in two consecutive years or, or uh, in more than two out of every five years. And again, the idea behind this one is, is that once it's established, it will survive in the crop residue for a number of years. So even if you rotate out one or two years, uh, that debris can still survive. Um, and this has been one of the main problems in Canada when they've really tried to shorten their rotations and grow canola after canola, that they've run into a lot of problems. And then if it is discovered, then they have to apply foliar fungicide, rogue out infected material, post-harvest residue management, or crop destruction. So that's the situation uh, in Oregon. Uh, a little bit closer to home, and this is um, uh, work with uh, Jim Davis. He discovered black leg in a field near Lewiston. Uh, this was a field of industrial rapeseed, that, uh, winter uh, rapeseed that had been planted that previous summer. They found that uh, two out of the six tru truckloads tested positive, but you'll notice how low the percent um, uh, infestation, 0 0.2 and 0.3%, but it's a zero tolerance pathogen, so, those, so that was enough to cause a problem. Uh, the grower didn't see it in the field, but Jim uh, sent some suspicious samples of Lindsay Dutoy, and she talked about that. Uh, these were actually the pictures, and I'll show, show you some more of these later, but these bleach stems with these little black dots which are the fruiting body are one of the key uh, identifications of this. And then she tested it in, the fee in, in her greenhouse to, to verify that this was pathogenic. These are actually cabbage uh, seedlings that she tested them with. Um, so it turns out that that seed um, that they used to, to, to grow it was negative when, when they went back and tested it. So the question that, that comes in our minds was it, um, could it have been from mustard weeds from uh, previous uh, growth of canola or was it, did it come in on the seed but it was a very, very low level and just wasn't detected. So it's still a lot of questions. So again, as uh, Lindsay talked about, um, it infects pretty much all crucifer crops and weeds, so all the mustards. It's seed borne, uh, will survive on those seed and crop residues for three to four years in the field and that's again why those, you have to have a very long rotations, uh, cannot be controlled by short rotations 
and then obviously the brassica weeds uh, need to be controlled. And then in terms of spread, and one of the reasons why this disease is opposed to the next one I'll talk about, which is a true soilborne pathogen, is because this is a foliar pathogen. So it's going to be attacking the stem, it's going to be attacking the leaves, but it has a number of ways that it can move around, not only from the infected seed, but also from these two different types of spores that are going to be produced in the field. So again, um, it can be spread around by rain splash of spores. So this can happen in the springtime. Uh, this can happen on irrigated uh, seed production plots in the Columbia Basin. So uh, we do have that potential of having it spread around in the crop uh, in the uh, late fall, early spring. It can also be spread by irrigation water. Uh, Lindsay talked a little bit about this, these airborne spores that are shot out in the air in the springtime. And then, of course, on seeds, transplants, machinery, and workers. So lots of ways of, of spreading this around. Uh, this is just a photograph of two of the different types of fruiting bodies that are formed. So essentially, these are like little containers that the fungus uh, produces called fruiting bodies. And then uh, they will mature and produce this little drop here. And this drop is composed of millions and millions of spores so that when a raindrop or an irrigation or whatever hits that, it will splash around and spread the disease further in the canopy. So it has this ability of very quickly producing generations after generations and spreading within the canopy, so kind of like a rust. Uh, this is a picture of the um, overwintering bodies, and I'll show you a, a picture of that in a minute. So again, it's caused by a fungus. It, it goes by two names. Uh, depending on whether it forms a sexual or asexual stage. I think in the future they're just going to give it one name. But you see it called Leptospheria maculans or the other stages of the Foma lingam. And again, the reason it's called black leg is because it produces this black discoloration, this black lesion at the base of the plant and can eventually uh, kill the plant. The other characteristic symptom, and this is what I want you to all look out for in the field, is if you see this lesion or kind of like a a uh, necrotic or brown spot, but you see these little black dots in that spot. That could be an indication of the fruiting bodies produced by this uh, fungus. Now it turns out there's also, you could have other things that can cause uh, black spots or brown spots on the, on the leaf, and there may be other saprophytes that come in later, but usually this is pretty characteristic uh, that you have these black dots being formed. And you also see these uh, lesions on the stem which are very characteristic. And then I'll, I'll go through some of these in a bit more detail here. Uh, one of the things you can find is on very early stages on the cotyledons, if you have a seed infection or you have the sexual stage reproducing in the, in the springtime, you can get actually an infection on the very first stage of the cotyledon. And if this happens, this means that it's got lots of time to reproduce throughout the season and spread. So you can see these little um, lesions here with those black dots, which are the fruiting bodies. Here's another close-up of them. A lot of times these um, dead areas are surrounded by a yellowing or chlorotic area around the lesion, which is another characteristic. Uh, here's some symptoms on some older leaves. And again, it can attack pretty much all stages of, of the leaves. And you can see those little uh, lesions with the black dots in them. Here's a close-up. Again, everything's kind of bleached out and killed. So essentially the pathogen went in there, killed all that tissue, established its infection, and then starts to reproduce by forming these little black fruiting bodies. And there's another, uh, oftentimes you'll see these in between the veins uh, produced. And then this is the symptom on the stem, so especially on the lower stem, and it will, if it gets at this stage, it will uh, kill the entire plant and, and get into the vascular system. And this is just a close-up of some of those uh, fruiting bodies on residue. So what happens is, once those infected stems fall to the ground, over winter, under the snow, it will form these fruiting bodies, and then in the springtime, they will puff out these spores and release these spores and start the whole infection process over again. And that's probably the stage they are in the Willamette Valley. They probably have enough infestation that they've got enough residue out there that those spores are being released. And what that means is those spores can be spread for miles just by wind. So that's the real uh, problem here. They're not just splashed around by rain, but they can be spread by wind. So Lindsay covered some of these uh, already, but again, the main thing is to start with disease-free certified seed. 
Uh, don't just borrow or get seed from your neighbor who hasn't uh, had any testing. And then all the seeds should be treated with fungicides, uh, which are a number of ones that are registered out there. Again, rotation, probably this should be four years between uh, brassica crops. Uh, control of volunteer and wild mustards. Now, she mentioned resistance, and this has been the mainstay of control in Canada for the last 20 years. However, they've got new races that have overcome that resistance, and it's become a real problem. And that's because all their resistance seems to be based on just one gene. And this is a trap that, that uh, plant breeders have often fallen into. You, you get something that works great for years and years and years, and then the pathogen figures out a way around it, and then all of a sudden you're, you're left holding the bag. So even though th there is resistance out there, uh, a lot of that resistance is being broken down. She also mentioned this, uh, of course, this is a no-till conference, but if you were to bury the residues, that would be effective, and then uh, spray protective foliar fungicides. And this, they do spray a lot of fungicides up in Canada during the crop year to try and, and, and keep those little incipient infections from spreading around and, and causing further problems. So again, uh, as, as Lindsay mentioned, we need to be vigilant and keep it out of our dryland production. She already talked about the possible role of cover crops in this whole thing. And the real threats are to the canola seed production in the Columbia Basin. And then also, as she talked about, this huge seed industry in the Skagit Valley uh, that would be uh, threatened. So that's uh, uh, that disease. In fact, why don't I just, I think we've got time. I'll maybe, uh, do I have time for a few questions, then I'll go on to the other. Sure. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, Dale's question is what happens if we find, if a grower finds that they, they have it? Uh, you know, I think that, and again, I'm not a regulatory person, but I think the thing that would have to be reported to Washington Department of Agri, and I think, I'm hoping that they have contingency plans and, and probably very similar to what, uh, I'm sure that they're gonna have a protocol, probably very similar to that, where they'll go out and inspect that they may have a crop destruction. Uh, you know, they may have you turn the field under, um, it, you know. But, uh, but the, the main thing I'll emphasize is to keep an eye out for it. And if you have anything that looks suspicious, take it to your county agent, send samples to myself or Lindsay or another pathologist uh, to really confirm it. Okay, so let me just briefly, and we'll have some more questions later on um, afterwards. Um, just briefly talk about another disease, and this one is a true soil-borne disease, so this one fortunately doesn't really have the capacity of spreading around. It's probably already in the soil. The only way that it can be moved around is by soil on equipment, etc. And uh, this one causes what we call a damping off, so it's really going to attack primarily the seedlings or the young plants. It goes by the name of wire stem, and I'll show you uh, why they call it that in a minute. So it's going to attack young seedlings, also attack the uh, tap root and, and be a root rotting organism. And um, if you've heard talks about rhizoctonia, you, you've heard us talk about these different groups or anastomosis groups. And the one that affects wheat is one we call uh, AG8. This one is called AG2-1. And this one appears to be highly virulent on pretty much all brassicas. So this would be canola, camelina, all the um, uh, brassica, vegetables, etc. Turns out it's also pathogenic on peas and lentils. We've demonstrated that. But so far, all the work we've done on cereals appears that it really doesn't do much damage to cereals. So in fact, uh, when we used to do root rot ratings with Kurt, I know we did some inoculated studies. We would find a few little lesions here and there, but it really doesn't appear to do much on the cereal, so it really appears to be more of a broadleaf uh, pathogen. Um, and, and one of the ways that we discovered it, this was a plot uh, that Bill Schillinger had of, um, of winter canola growing on some irrigated land in Lynn. Uh, we got a good crop up, and then about two weeks later, he started to see these plants dying within the row. And, uh, and then when we took a look at them, we found that they were infected. We isolated a fungus, put it back into the greenhouse, and reproduce these very typical symptoms. And, and this is why they call it wire stem. So what's happening here is the pathogen is down in the soil and then uh, grows up the, the young stem and then completely kills or girdles that seedling so it'll completely kill it off. And there's a close-up uh, there and another close-up. So here you can see living tissue above, but it's completely killed this tissue. So the seedlings will just uh, completely flop over and die. So you'll, you'll get a, a, a big reduction in, in stands. 
And it can also attack older seedlings. So this was a, a plot we had at the Cook Farm a few years ago where you saw these dead plants uh, next to live plants. And when we dug those up, these carcasses here, and looked at the stem, you could see, again, this very characteristic um, browning that was moving up the stem from the roots. And here's some other examples here. So uh, in this respect, it's kind of like black leg, and then it's at the lower base of the stem here. But you never see those little bleached out areas with all the little black specks in it. This is just as generally a, a browning, kind of a dark brown color uh, that's moving up here. And to kindly finish it off, there are, turns out, a few other rhizoctonias that can also cause uh, stunting. This is one called a binucleate, uh, one that we tested out in the greenhouse. But I've never really seen much evidence in the field that this is really uh, doing much. Uh, here's another example of one of those serrato uh that are out there. So again, management of this one, uh, crop rotation is probably not going to be beneficial because it has a wide host range. And it also appears that uh, I think that it can actually survive on the wheat and barley. Um, even though it's not doing much damage, I think it enables it to carry it over. Turns out when we survey our areas around here, we find 2-1 pretty much in every area that we've surveyed. So it's, it's one of those indigenous ones. Uh, seed treatments, we haven't seen much protection against it. And I think that's because the seed treatment has to have the ability of being systemically transport it up to that young hypocotyl for at least two or three weeks to protect it. And I just don't think a lot of those have that capability. Uh, we don't uh, have any resistance, although we'll probably start to look for that again. Uh, and then here's a few um, good uh, resources. So the specific Northwest uh, Plant Disease Management Handbook's on the web. Uh, it's got a lot of the fungicides uh, that are registered. Um, there's also a book that's put out by the uh, Society of Plant Pathology on brassica diseases. And then, of course, a lot of the best information comes out of Canada. They've got lots of neat things on their website uh, because they grow so much canola up there. So I think with that, um, that's all I have. So are there any questions before we move on to another disease? Ron. Yeah, I, I, I'll have to admit I don't know much about those diseases, but I know they're a big problem in Europe. But of course, Europe has a really much different climate than we do, a wet climate. Um, so I, I'm just thinking that that's probably why it showed up in the Willamette Valley. It may not show up here. I've never, never seen any. So our low humidity might protect us from it, it, somewhat from... It, it could, but again, I'd have to look and see whether those were seed-borne or how those were introduced. I mean, it, it turns out a lot of these diseases are uh, unfortunately introduced by people moving seed or plants or whatever from some of these infected areas. So, uh, I, yeah, I don't know too much about those diseases. So our next speaker is, is uh, Jim Davis. Uh, Jim is a research support scientist with the University of Idaho Canola Rapeseed Mustard and Mustard Program. He is a, a North Idaho native and has worked in canola rapeseed and mustard at the University of Idaho uh, for the past 26 years. So, Jim. All right, thanks. I want to start by mentioning some online resources. Tim mentioned some. There's a lot of online resources, uh, websites, University of Idaho, the WSU Biofuels, Oilseed Cropping System uh, Group has a good website. Pacific Coast Canola now has a website. Uh, U.S. Canola Association, the Canola Council of Canada, on and on. One I just found that's really cool uh, is the Canola Encyclopedia, which is a Canola Council of, Can of Canada one. Um, it's, there's a lot of information, and I put together a handout of a lot of these and Megan is going to pass those around if you haven't picked one up from me already yet. Uh, so you don't have to scribble these links down in, in, a, in, a, in a big hurry. Um, so I'm going to start talking uh, with diseases. Uh, I'll continue from, from Tim talk, talk, talk a little bit about Stoyertania white mold or stem rot. Uh, this is a, a fungal disease that infects the crop from a resting body that's in the soil. Uh, it's either there from a previous broadleaf crop or perhaps a contaminant in the seed. It needs warm, wet conditions uh, to infect the crop. And so typically it's more of a problem in our area with winter canola because the crop is at a susceptible stage when things are wet uh, in the early part of the summer or a problem in irrigated canola. 
this is what the uh, sclerotia or the resting body looks like in seed. So obviously you want to start with certified seed that's not going to have that. Under the right conditions of the soil, uh, warm moist conditions, these resting bodies, sclerotia germinate and they produce these little cup shaped pruning structures and these are going to produce spores that will be ejected and float up onto the crop. Now the interesting thing is that these spores will only germinate on the canola flower petals. Um, and so what happens if canola is flowering produces a lot of petals, you know, enough to completely cover the ground. And so if petals happen to land like in a leaf axle, for example, which is pretty common, or even on the surface of a leaf, the spores will land there, they can germinate, and then they can infect the plant after that. And what you end up with then is this infection in the stem and you've got this sort of white mold looking thing going on and that will girdle the stem and kill the plant and so later in the season what you see are these light colored white plants that sort of look like they've just matured early but typically uh, they've been unable to fill seed and so there's not going to be any seed in those pods. As the fungus continues its life, cycle, its life cycle of the plant, it will produce a new set of sclerotia inside the stem, and then these end up in the soil ready to infect the next broadleaf crop, or they might end up in the seed as well as the stems get ground up in the combine and, 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 they, get, and they get sorted out. So control, again, we've kind of got the same mantra going. We want to start with certified disease-free seed. Uh, typically a four-year crop rotation from any broadleaf crop. So this um, disease can affect anything from peas to potatoes. Uh, and, and so when you're looking at crop rotations, you have to be thinking about more than just canola or mustard. There are some fungicides that are available uh, when you are going to have enough of a infestation to make it uh, economically important. Uh, you would apply that typically at the beginning, the first part of flowering, because you want to prevent the infection. Once the crop has already in, been infected, the fungicide is really not going to do any good on that particular plant. Um, as a general rule, it's only going to pay to put on, down the fungicide if the infection rate is going to be greater than 20%, or there's a scoring system that I'll talk about a little bit more if that score comes out to be greater than 40 on a scale of 1 to 100. There are some labeled, and fungi labeled fungicides. Uh, a couple of those are Endura and Quadrus. I should mention that Headline, which is we commonly use in our wheat and, and around, is not labeled for the control of Sclerotinia. Uh, this is a fungicide that is also marketed as having plant growth improvement characteristics. And I know that people have applied it for that on canola. I'm not going to say whether it works or not, but my thought is it's not a good idea to overuse it. This is a fungicide that we might need for black leg. It's not going to help you with sclerotinia at, at all if you do have it. So I'll talk a little bit more about this, if I can hit the right button, uh, about this sclerotinia uh, stem rot checklist. And this is available on the Canola Council website, and although sometimes you can actually pick up pre-printed versions, but they have this as a PDF, and so you can print, you can print it out and look at it. And it's basically got a number of things for you to, uh, to evaluate, so you can decide, you can predict whether or not you're going to have an infestation that's going to be large enough that you're going to want to consider a fungicide. So first off, you're going to look at the last uh, the number of years since the last canola or broadleaf crop. Um, so, for example, if it's been more than six years, you're going to give it a, a score of zero. You know, if it's been one or two years, you're going to give it ten points. Uh, then you want to think about the disease incidence in that last host crop. Uh, you know, from none to high, and so you get it. You know, from zero to fifteen more points. The crop <coughs> density uh, ranging from low normal to high because this uh, fungus is dependent on some high humidity conditions so if you have a low crop density the humidity is going to be lower so you're going to have less chance of infection. 
Uh, again, related to humidity and moisture is how much rain you've had in the last two weeks. Some of our growing areas in here, that's not going to be an issue, obviously. Um, we always hope we can get more rain rather than less. We're going to take a look at the weather forecast. So, you know, we're probably at the stage where your canola is just starting to bolt. So you want to take a look at the weather forecast for the next couple weeks uh, and see what the chances of rain are. And so the higher chance of rain, the more points you're going to assign again. And then this last one, which they term regional risk for apothecia development. The apothecia is that little fruiting structure that releases the spores. And in Canada, I believe they've actually publishing some of these numbers or, or people, growers can get them from, from their, their, their agronomists. In our case, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to go out there and dig around and look for these fruiting bodies and see if you can find any in the soil and, and, uh, and see if they're starting to, germ starting to germinate. So this one is, will be a little more, for, more difficult for us to evaluate. But if we've got, if we've recently had a broadleaf crop that's been infected, and we've got the right weather conditions, you're probably going to go with a 10-point score on, on that, just as a general thing, since we don't have a really good way to evaluate that. And then you add these all up, and if you get more than 40, you want to seriously think about putting down some fungicide. Uh, I know that's what's happened in this area, is typically dryland growers don't see it on a regular basis, uh, so it's pretty rare to, to spray. Uh, fungicide in those cases. Uh, there were, there has been some winter canola production in the Walla Walla area and they had perfect conditions for it um, and it was a real problem for them and we see less winter canola in that area because of the disease. Um, but now that prices are a little higher than they were 10 or 15 years ago, it'll actually, it's a little more economically feasible to come in and, and spray for it. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, oh, and the other thing that I should mention, of course, if you're in an irrigated situation, you're setting up the conditions really well for it, and so you want to try to avoid irrigation during flowering. So get your water put down before the crop flowers and hope for some dry, some dry weather. But if you are in an irrigated system, uh, it's definitely something you want to have in your toolkit is, is thinking about putting down some of those, uh, one of those fungicides. So I'm going to switch gears now and, and move into some insect pests. I'm going to focus primarily on spring canola, and I think Dale's going to look at winter canola with in a little more detail. There's a lot of insects that will chew on canola. I'm going to start talking about flea beetle. There's a number of different species of flea beetle, uh, and in this picture uh, I've got three types. We've got the Crucifer flea beetle, which is an introduced type that's our main pest. There's also the striped flea beetle, which is introduced, which is not as common. Actually, I've not personally seen one in the Pacific Northwest, but they are around in Canada. And then there's some native flea beetles to, to, the, uh, to North America. The hop flea beetle is one example. Those are typically not a pest. So what you're looking for is these larger, rounder shaped black ones. There's a number of seed treatments that are very effective that have uh, insecticide uh, in their active ingredients. Uh, and most canola seed you're going to buy is treated and you should request treated seed to control this pest. Um, Helix Extra or Cruiser, which is the same fungicide without the uh, uh, fun, is the same seed treatment without fungicides. Uh, Prosper 400. I believe these two chemistries are starting to be phased out and be replaced by Helix Vibrance and Prosper Evergoal. The new chemistries have the same insecticide, but they have a little different spectrum of fungicides. Now even though we get really good control with the seed treatments, and it's very economical, um, typically it's going to save you money by paying for a seed treatment, some years we're actually going to need a foliar application on top of those seed treatments. Uh, and I've seen this most commonly during wet springs, when it's cool and wet, the crop is growing fairly slowly and will maybe have, you know, an inch of rain or so while the plants are uh, in the seedling stage. And what I think is happening there is that the crop is growing slowly, the roots are not developing as quickly, 
and the the rain is actually diluting the seed treatment away from the roots and so the plants aren't taking up as much as much of it because typically under good conditions at the rates we use these seed treatments ought to be good for at least four or five weeks uh, if not longer and so if we have these cool wet conditions and then it warms up you need to be out scouting your fields and looking for flea beetle damage because they can do a lot of damage in a short period of time because we have really high populations in areas that where canola has been produced for a few years. Once you get to about 20 to 25 percent defoliation, you're going to be wanting to spray right away. Uh, there's also a great YouTube video that uh, the Canola Council has put up and you can also find it on the Canola Encyclopedia website. I just search for flea beetle management. It's got lots of pictures. Uh, and pictures of, of the plants when they're ready to spray. But so I thought I'd try to give you an example on what 20% defoliation looks like. Uh, so as we look at here in the middle, we've got a 20% on this side and a 30% here. Uh, this is 20 and 30%. Uh, this is 30 and 80%. And so, if you're at this growth stage, you know you're going to be wanting to think, you're going to be wanting to spray when the crop gets like this. And so, you need to know ahead of time because you're going to have this aerially applied. Uh, you're going to crawl, call up your crop duster, and you say, "Oh, I'm putting down fungicides on wheat, or I'm putting down herbicides on wheat," and that's everybody's bread and butter. And so, it might be a week before he gets to your crop, and by then it's going to be gone. And so, you need to be out there scouting the crop and. And, and be ready to jump on this. A little larger growth stage in these years when we might have to have that rescue application I talked about. Uh, if your crop is starting to look like this uh, with, with these pot marks, some chewing along the edges, and it's not shown in this picture, but the growing point is really the key. The growing point is going to get, going to get chewed up, and what happens is those new leaves aren't able to expand. It really slows the crop down. And even though it might be able to get through this infestation, that's going to delay your maturity. And in spring canola the Pacific Northwest, getting it mature as quickly as possible is a real key because we want to try to beat as much of the heat as we can. Uh, what you want to avoid, you know, you start getting to this stage, you're going to want to spray. You want to avoid your crop looking like this. You don't want to get to that point. Some of the other talks, uh, Yesterday and today we've mentioned that our most common canola varieties are Brassica napus, but we also have some Brassica juncea canola. This is a Brassica juncea leaf. The symptoms on it look a little different. They tend to get holes all the way through. Uh, and the juncea looks a little <coughs> worse just because of the nature of the damage. Uh, it can actually handle a little more damage than the Brassica napus canola. But if you're getting to a stage like this on the plants when they're small, you know, maybe th uh, two to three leaves or four leaves, uh, you're probably going to want to think about a foliar application. Uh, another insect pest that you might see in spring canola, but we probably won't see every year, is the diamondback moth. It's, the, it's not the adult that causes problems, it's the larvae. So you see a few of these flying around. They're little guys, when they're flying, they look white. You don't need to really worry about them until you got start to see a pretty large population and they lay eggs. You do multiple generations a year and you get these tiny little caterpillars. And they're a problem during flowering because they eat the flower buds. Uh, another key characteristic is if, if you go out there and, and you hit the plant, they'll fall off the plant and they hang by little webs, kind of like a spider. Uh, if you drive through the crop with a sprayer and you come out of the, the crop, they'll be hanging all over the tractor. Um, with those, if you have 10 to 15 per square foot, roughly 10 per plant, it's time to think about putting on an insecticide. Cabbage seed pod weevil can be a really big problem in winter canola. Its life cycle corresponds with winter canola very well in, in uh, the northwest. But typically it's not much of a problem on spring canola because by the time spring canola is susceptible, uh, when it has pods that are large enough for the adults to lay their eggs on, the adults have already laid their eggs in the winter canola. The larvae are eating the winter canola seed out, 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 out of the pod. The adults have died. Um, what you might see in your spring canola in mid to late July as it's going out of flower and starting to produce pods 
you might see the new generation of cabbage seed pod weevil in your spring canola crop. Those aren't going to lay eggs until the following spring and they're not going to do enough feeding damage on their own to be a problem. And so if you're out there scouting your field, in your, in your spring canola field, you find a few cabbage seed pod weevil, don't worry about it because they're not going to do, do any damage. Um, however, you're probably going to find some aphids. And if their populations get high enough, uh, you can actually have some pretty serious yield losses due to uh, cabbage aphid, as well as turnip aphids and some other aphids. And what they do is they tend to congregate on the growing points, and if you get enough of them, they'll actually kill the flowers, and they cause the pods to not form well. Uh, they delay maturity. Um, you know, best case scenario, maybe, maybe this bud wouldn't be killed, it would keep growing, but it slows it way down. And so we've got that problem with delayed maturity again. Here's a couple other pictures. Uh, they just get thick and they're nasty looking uh, up there on, on the stems. So if you have about one in five infested flower stalks, so about 20%, that's time to start thinking about getting some insecticide on pretty quickly. Uh, oftentimes the colonies aren't this obvious, they're smaller and so they'll be in amongst the flower buds. So you do need to actually get in there and look closely. Um, although, you know, if you see them like this, well, you know, they're, all, they're already there. Um, and so this is, you know, the view from a distance. Um, I don't know how well it shows up to you guys, but, but there are some aphids on some of these flower stalks, a little dark, dark areas. And you can see these guys haven't flowered. It, these aphids are delaying the maturity on, on, on those. Here's turnip aphids buried in amongst the flowers, so a little more difficult to see. Um, more the same color of the stem, and so you sometimes have to look a little closer. Uh, we've got a number of foliar insecticides now available to us. Um, my experience has been is that they're all pretty effective. Uh, I believe that all those active ingredients, the first five, are labeled for all the insect pests you might, you might encounter, although the last one, the fulfill, is just a, an aphidicide. Um, and, you know, there's different prices on them, so you need to work with, with your field rep and, and decide what's going to work best, best for you. Uh, in our plots, I've had really good luck with the uh, Lambda Cyhalophrine, Warrior, Warrior 2, Karate. It's got a number of different <coughs> trade names, as do these others. There are some generics that are a little bit cheaper. Uh, one of the reasons I've gone with Warrior uh, is just easy to get uh, because it's registered for a wide variety of crops. So that's all I've got. Uh, you guys have questions um, for me now, that would be great if we have time. But you can also email me or call me or, or call Jack Brown or email Jack and we're more than happy to try to find answers to your questions. Uh, the, the question is, is about if I'm aware of any work been done with uh, biologicals for the control of sclerotinia and I don't know. I, I'm not aware of any. Of any. Uh, the question is about irrigation timing on winter canola, uh, whether you want to go during flowering and pod fill to support the crop or to avoid sclerotinia. Um, the growers that I've worked with personally uh, who've been growing winter canola in the rotation for oh, at least 10 years have built up a reasonable level of sclerotinia, sclerotinia in their soil and they also grow potatoes in that crop rotation. And so they're very interested in controlling the sclerotinia. And so what they found in their situation is they try to get the water on right before flowering and, and, and hope that they're going to have enough water to take them through flowering. But they're going to monitor the soil. And so if it's particularly hot and dry, uh, they, they're, they're, they're not going to sacrifice their yield to avoid that. Um, if you're a new grower, irrigated grower, you've not had broadleaf crops, which seems like a stretch, then it's not going to be a, that big of a worry because you're not going to have, have, it, you know, have it in your soil. 
Uh, and one particular grower I know, he's pretty much just, I think, gone to this general practice of spraying for sclerotinia because he wants to keep the population low because of his potatoes. Um, and so even though he might not be an economic level in his canola, he's looking at his entire crop rotation. Uh, and this particular guy is in a four-year crop rotation where he does wheat, canola, wheat, and potatoes. So he's got two crops in that four years that are, are a host. So our last speaker this afternoon for our session is uh, Dale Whaley. Uh, Dale is an extension educator and has been working with WSU Extension for the past 12 years and uh, is currently assisting Douglas, Chelan, uh, Kittitas, Okanagan County residents with their agriculture and uh, integrated weed management needs. Dale, thanks. Okay, well today I'm going to talk about insect pests and, and some of the slides that we'll see will be uh, a little bit of a, of a reflection of what Jim had talked about. But this is what we want when we're growing canola. And this is winter canola. This is up in northern Douglas County. You can see that we have a really good stand establishment. That was one of the big problems that we had starting off. Um, we can see that, you know, transitions into a great crop. You know, we're trying to shoot for that magic ton to the acre. That's kind of what everybody shoot, shoots for, you know, pods the size of snap beans. But, uh, you know, it's kind of like the Kevin Costner film. You know, when you build it, they will come. And so we have this great looking stands of canola, but now we have the cabbage seed pod weevil showing up, uh, ligus bugs, aphids, flea beetles, and a host of others, including your diseases. And so how do you know when to treat uh, your field for these insect pests? You know, do we just look at the calendar and go, well, yeah, I remember putting on some insecticides back in, uh, you know, maybe May 7th, or I remember my neighbor putting on a product, or my grandpa several years ago put on a product. I better go out there and put on that same product. Do we do that? And everybody in the room should say, no. What we gotta do is we gotta know what's going on in our fields. We gotta know um, where those pest levels are at. And just real briefly, I just wanna uh, explain the slide. So here we have number of pests we have uh, average density of pests, so this, this population of, of insect pests will fluctuate depending upon weather, uh, control methods, and so forth. And then we have the economic injury level, which is this level here, and this is the level of pest damage that is equal to the cost of control. So in other words, if, if it's going to cost, we'll just throw out a number, $20,000 to control uh, insect X, they've already done $20,000 worth of damage, so we've kind of already missed our opportunity um, to, to really gain any on that problem. And so really what we want to do is we want to come to this level here, this economic treatment or action threshold to stop that pest population from reaching this um, economic injury level. Hopefully that all makes sense to you guys. So how do we know what these levels are in our fields? Well, you got to be out there and you got to be looking. You can't just think about it at night or be watching TV and going, you know, I wonder what's going on in my field. You gotta actually be out there looking for, you know, the signs and symptoms of maybe diseases on your canola or looking for uh, insect damage or the actual insect themselves. And I will show you what some of those guys look like. So ways to field sample, sweep net. How many in the room own a sweep net? One, two. How many in the room grow canola? One. One, okay, well then you're just, a, you just like having a sweep net, that's great. Uh, sweep net, beating sheets for like maybe the diamondback moth, you're out there, you know, you hit the plants, you start to drop down. Stem sampling, this is for aphids. Uh, sticky traps, if you're looking for uh, other insects, insects like the color yellow, so they will be attracted to that. So uh, a lot of questions I get from producers in my area is, well, where do I sample? You know, do the, should I sample just right along the road because it's easy access. You know, I can just stop the pickup, maybe get out and look, or maybe slow down, see what's going on. Or do I walk out in the middle of the field and take a sample? You know, these guys, well, where, do, where, do I, where should I look for this stuff? Well, what I tell them is look all over your fields. You know, if there's very few flat fields in where I'm from, Douglas County. So, you know, you might have a portion of a field and then you got to draw. And maybe that portion of the one field might be okay, but you go down into that draw and maybe that's where, you know, all hell's breaking loose. You got to get out there and you got to look in your fields. That's one of my plugs about sampling. Okay, so the first insect pest that, uh, that we've had a big problem with up in our area is the cabbage seed pod weevil. 
And um, you know, typical of, of, of all your weevils, they have you know the elbowed antenna, long snout. You know, these guys are small, three to four millimeters. You know, ash gray and colored. And um, this is what they look like. Uh, life cycle of these guys, um, adults over winter, they will emerge and start to uh, become active um, when temperatures rise above 12 degrees Celsius. They will then um, fly around, and once they get on the buds here, that's where they start to um, feed and lay their eggs. Eggs uh, develop in the pods themselves. They'll drop out as a uh, larvae, pupate in the soil, and will repeat this process over again. Damage symptoms uh, of larval feeding. So here we have uh, a larvae inside the, the, uh, the pod. And uh, when the larva consume the seeds within the pod, the undamaged seeds uh, enlarge and continue to grow. And so you get these misshapen pods. So here on the top, you have one that, that's normal. And then you get these twisted and bent pods. And if you pop those open, you will see larvae inside feeding on those pods. And so that's a, a great cue of, wow, that does not look normal. I better go over there and start pulling apart some of those pods, see what's going on. Monitoring? Late, yes, question. It's too late then. It's, yeah, so the comment is it's kind of too late then. I mean, you, you, you really got to be out there looking for the adults, um, correct. But if for some reason you've, you've, you've missed that phase and you're seeing these twisted up pods, that will tell you um, what's going on and then we'll give you an idea of what you need to do for your next round of canola. That's a good point. Monitoring, so time to monitoring is at this stage when the, uh, the adults are, are on those... Um, on those buds, do that with a sweep net. So if this is your field, I recommend monitoring the borders and also taking samples in the interior part of that field. Um, so threshold and management, so insecticide application is warranted when an average of 30 to 40 adults are collected per 10 sweeps. So if you're out there and you're taking a side to side 180 sweep with your net and you're collecting three to four adults per sweep, multiply that out and um, 30 to 40 adults, and that's your treatment threshold. Um, up in our area, we don't know why cabbage seed pod weevil um, is as abundant as it is, but I have been um, or found plants where one plant, tap that into a tray or into a, a, a white sheet, and I have 100 adults off of one plant. They're dripping with cabbage seed pod weevil, and so we need to figure out why is that? I mean, why do we have such huge populations? Anyways, that's one of our problems. So cultural control, you can use trap crops. So basically you can uh, plant uh, maybe a border of an earlier um, growing variety so that those guys glom onto those particular plants and you go in and spray just that instead of treating your whole field. If you don't wanna maybe mix of varieties, you could just plant your variety a little earlier. Um, deer might come in and, and, and eat that, but this could you know, be used as a trap crop for cabbage seed pod weevil. Chemically, there are a number of seed treatments and foliar sprays, and all this information can be found in the uh, uh, insect uh, management book for the Pacific Northwest. And whenever you're spraying, it's just a plug. You know, try to minimize um, you know, non-target effects, you know, uh, especially when the canola is flowering and, and whatnot. You know, we have a lot of honeybees out there foraging, so it's just a plug to try to save the honeybees. Uh, cabbage aphid, uh, if you've never seen an aphid up close, this is what they look like. Um, got little cornicles here, little exhaust pipes, and these have piercing sucking mouth parts, so they're sucking the juices out of the canola and causing the damage. Here's what the damage looks like. Um, so the, the plants can appear stunted, um, have short nodes, uh, leaves could curl up, maybe exhibit some purplish coloring, which you might think might be like a nutrient deficiency, but really it, it's, it's uh, aphid feeding. And the problem with this for, uh, for a winter canola stand, this going into the winter, these plants right here are probably gonna not make it. They're probably gonna die, succumb to the winter, winter kill. And that's not good with aphids. So turn over the leaves, you can find colonies like this. And then um, as uh, Jim had, had mentioned, you know, you get to uh, populations like this, that's feeding up on the heads. Um, this isn't good, they can cause the, the abortion of seeds and so forth and really affect yield. So this is, uh, this is not good. Monitoring thresholds uh, should be scouted bi-weekly. What we have found up in our area is whenever they start cutting corn and quincy, the aphids move 
and they just look for those first green fields up in our way, and boy, they just come dropping out of the sky. It's, it's like rain and aphids, and so um, got to watch for aphids. Treat for aphids when populations exceed uh, two plants per seedling stage, five per leaf. And again, as Jim mentioned, you know, you have 20% of your heads are infested uh, during the bloom is a treatment threshold. Management options biologically, um, coccinella beetles or ladybug beetles um, can eat a phenomenal amount of aphids, uh, up to 500 uh, in their lifetime. And so um, when these guys are out there, it's, it, you got to kind of start to ask yourself, do I have a, a good enough population of beneficials? So again, when I was talking about monitoring, in addition to looking for the pest, also look for your beneficials. So ladybird beetles, maybe um, lacewing larvae and so forth and then make that judgment call. Chemical controls, there are a number um, of products, but generally the rule of thumb, do not treat late blooming canola for aphids because the populations usually decline, decline after bloom. So you don't want to be wasting money that way. Ligus bugs or tarnished plant bugs. Um, these guys, if you've ever not seen them, they have a triangle shape typical of all, all your true bugs seen here. Um, compared to your the immatures, which will be green in color, and they'll have these little black dots. And so that's the distinguishing um, characteristics between the two. Damage symptoms, um, adult lichus bugs feed on the developing buds seen here, and um, flowers and seed pods resulting in dis distortion and abortion of seed pods, um, known in the literature as blasting. And uh, they will also feed on the stems in this picture here. So they're out there with those piercing sucking mouth parts, sucking the juices out of these pods and stems and causing um, a reduction in yield that way. Monitoring, start scouting fields at the bud stage. Again, use a sweep net or you could use a, a beading tray or beading sheet. Um, you, you're gonna wanna do this when temperatures are above 20 degrees Celsius and when the crop canopy is dry. So up in our area, if we ever get a rain, which we hardly, hardly ever do, um, but when it does rain, insect activity is basically nil. They drop down to the, to the floor and, and you're not going to find anything. And again, um, remember that insects are cold-blooded, so if it's super, super cold out, you're probably not going to get a lot of insect activity. You're going to want to sample when things are warm, warm sunny days. Take 10 sweeps side to side, sweeping through the area, and your threshold management. So treat if uh, you're finding 15 lagus bugs uh, at the, between the bud stage and petal drop or if you're finding 20 ligus bugs uh, after petal drop um, with those 10 sweeps, that would be your treatment threshold. So options, uh, biologically, there are several insects that will attack um, ligus bugs. Um, you know, some of your, there's some parasitic wasps, um, some damsel bugs and so forth will go after the adults. Chemically, there are a number of products, you know, seed treatments, you know, bifenthrin and others, Warrior. Um, the list that was read earlier um, will work. Flea beetle, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we already talked about flea beetle, but a uh, little larger picture of, of, of the two. So this is uh, this one, <laughs> and this is the striped flea beetle here. These guys are small, and it, uh, I've seen a few of these, uh, of this one here, and they're very characteristic. They're called flea beetles because they like to jump. They spring like fleas. And so you get, when you're down there looking around the leaves and whatnot, they're just popping. And so that's what you're going to want to look for. And make sure you got your glasses on because, again, these guys are tiny. Um, life cycle, they're going to do the most damage uh, as larvae and adults between May and June um, on the winter canola. Uh, here you can see severe feeding damage. Similar pictures as what we saw earlier compared to uh, undamaged seedlings. Monitor the borders of, of the field because these guys can move in uh, pretty rapidly and they will um, stay around the borders and cause a lot of damage. Continue scouting like it was said before for two weeks because these guys can move in quickly and they can cause a lot of damage uh, very rapidly. So again, uh, the similar, similar picture, uh, that economic treatment threshold is 25% because they are going to reach if you don't do anything at 25% in a couple days, you're going to be beyond 50% and those seedlings are going to not be very happy. Management options, cultural control, um, varieties that have high seedling vigor or, you know, that produce uh, rapid growth uh, might be an option culturally for, for this particular pest. Crop rotation, I have a question mark. Um, with crop rotation, really the literature says it's not effective method 
for control because the overwintering adults uh, will overwinter, the, the adults will overwinter inside and outside of that crop and are capable of long range migration. So you might think you're, you're, you're free and clear, but lo and behold, bang, there they are. So you gotta be out there looking in your fields. Biologically, um, the answer is no. Unfortunately, you know, these guys emerge in large numbers and can overtake um, any of your beneficial insects and still create quite a bit of damage. Uh, chemical, there's a number of seed treatments and post-emergent foliar sprays. Again, I'm referred to the Pacific Northwest uh, Insect Man Management Handbook. And there's a, uh, a number of other insect pests um, mentioned, you know, the diamondback moth. Last year in our area, grasshoppers were a big problem. Um, lots of them. I mean, lots. Uh, the economic threshold for, for treatment threshold is, is 7 to 12 grasshoppers per meter. And um, I think we exceeded that in some areas. And when guys were cutting canola, um, you know, you could look behind them in, in the bulk tank and it's like canola seeds and grasshoppers, canola seeds and grasshoppers. I mean, just literally hundreds of them. And I was kidding with one of the producers. I said, well, just think of your, your, your protein is up, you know? And uh, he didn't think that was very funny, but um, that's all I've had for, for insects. Uh, I think we have questions for the panel now, uh, for any of you that, uh, have additional questions for the three of us? So the question is, is, is on aphids with biological uh, control, is there any recommendations or is there anything out in the literature that says, you know, if you have X amount of, of you know, beneficial ladybird beetle or ladybug, um, you know, I have not seen that in the literature. I think it's uh, a judgment call. Um, if you're seeing very few, you know, that might not be enough. I know that, uh, you know, um, it's difficult to spray when you know you're killing beneficial insects, but sometimes um, there's not enough. And so, and other times, you know, you might think, wow, there, there's, there's plenty and we're just gonna ride it out and see what happens. So that's a good question. Um, if I can make a comment on that. What I've noticed if you're scouting on a regular basis, you can see the aphid numbers increase. Mm -hmm. And so if they're increasing rapidly, you don't see very many beneficials or predators there. Uh, and you, you get to that threshold of 20% infected stems in short order, you're going to need to spray. If you're out there, you're watching, you're seeing a few aphids, you're seeing some ladybugs, the populations are not increasing very fast, just keep watching it, and, and there's a good chance that they are going to be able to keep that uh, aphid population in check. So it's a matter of just watching and see what's going on in your field and how quickly it's changing. Yeah, like Jim said, the key is watching that. You gotta be out there, boots on the ground with, with these insect pests. I have a question. Yeah, question. So how often have you seen ligus bugs that were thick enough that you needed to spray for them? Um, for some reason, again, they, they must like Douglas County because I have seen, um, out sampling for cabbage seed pod weevil, um, a tremendous amount of li ligus bugs um, beyond the 20. Um, and, and why that is, I, again, I don't know. I don't know if, if we just grow superior canola and they, they like the taste of it or what. But yeah, um, again, literature says that um, you know, you're probably only gonna, going to experience 20% uh, damage to the crop. But you know, when, when guys are trying to hit that ton to the acre and they're losing 200 pounds, um, or I guess 400 pounds, 20%, you know, they're not, they're not gonna like that. And so, yeah, those are, those are, are two prominent pests, the ligus bug and the cabbage seed pod weevil addition with the aphids. So. Yeah, we typically don't see very many ligus bugs on the east side, but we've got a lot of different mi microclimates. You wanna make any comments on how to sample with the sweep net in winter canola that's five feet tall? Uh, sample in winter canola, five feet tall, <clears throat> well, um, you know, always with your traditional sweep net, you know, you want to take your sweep side to side, you know, 180 degree. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you can, you know, you can swing it like you're, you know, last on a rope, you know. Um, don't be afraid uh, to do that because, you know, uh, canola is pretty, it's pretty tough. Um, you know, you're not going to be ripping pods off or like, you know, you just did that in a wheat field that was, you know, getting ripe. That, that's going to be a bad idea. But, um, yeah, you know, hopefully your canola is five feet tall. To sample, so so the question was uh, this past year was pretty dry. What percentage of canola was planted in Douglas County? 
Um, without having the, the actual records on hand, um, what I can tell you is, is that we've increased canola acres immensely in our county. When I started in 07, we had um, two producers growing about uh, two to 400 acres each. So we'll just go to the high end and say um, 800 acres. Now we're over um, between 12 and 14,000 acres, 28 producers. And um, even though it was dry, um, it, it really depends upon when you plant that canola and when you, you know, get that seed into moisture. Um, you know, you got to plant when Mother Nature tells you. That's what we found in our area. And um, if, if you, even if you're on the combine, if the conditions are right for seeding, you better stop harvest and seed that canola to get a stand. So uh, a lot of guys uh, have put it in, and uh, we're just going to see what happens. I mean, we, we have very little snow, so we try to get a lot of our moisture from that snow, and, and I, we're going to be in a drought unless we get some real timely rains. So. What about the same number of acres got, got planted this past? Uh, it's probably, it might be down a little bit due to the rotational, you know, like last year was high, you know, this year is going to be down a little bit, you know, next year will be high. But yeah, we're probably upwards around seven, 8,000 acres just in, in between Douglas and Okanagan County. I can't, I can't speak for the rest of the state, I don't know.